This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. We've got a really interesting topic this week that uh, appeals to me enormously. We've also got a great guest. His name's Michael Watson. Uh, he is a former summer fellow here at the Mises Institute. He's presented a couple of different times at our research conferences. He is a PhD candidate at George Mason University and professor of economics at Belmont Abbey College in North Carolina while he's finishing up his PhD. So, Michael, thank you for joining us. Great to see you. Thank you. The, the topic, ladies and gentlemen, is what lies outside of economics? Uh, this relates to a paper Michael just delivered about a week ago at our uh, research conference last weekend, uh, where he was talking about some some uh, things like Thomistic personalism, uh, which is a, a form of, of uh, Catholic thought, and and applying this to economics and to praxeology and to Misesian thought. So I thought that we would broaden this a little bit and talk about uh, what sort of actions we ought to think of as economic and, and what we ought to think of otherwise. So that said, Michael, we, let, let's start. I know this is a huge topic, but let's start with Mises presents this idea of praxeology that humans act. Uh, they have a means and end mindset, but he also defined economics as a subset of praxeology. So in that sense, Mises uh, appears to be thinking that there are, there, there's human action that takes place outside of economics per se. So we need a definition of Economics and economics, we usually talk about, at least in the Austrian school, catalactics, uh, that is exchange, uh, market exchange uh, and barter. Uh, so buying and selling. Uh, but then there's also another part of, you know, um, of praxeology. Uh, we can talk about the gift or we can talk about violence. Uh, Mises talks about autistic action, that is unilateral action. There's no bilateral. There's no buying, buying and selling. Mm -hmm. So if I take my fist and I punch you, that's violence. That's an autistic, quote unquote, action, a unilateral action. He would say that's within praxeology. Um, my end is to harm you, whatever the, you know, maybe it's some, I want to rob you or I want to uh, get the enjoyment out of beating someone up. So I take my fist, I hit you, and the means is the fist, throwing my fist, right? Um, and that time that I use to inflict that violence. But there's also the opposite, giving someone something. So I, one could imagine a situation where someone's unconscious. They don't have the ability to say no. And you help them, someone in a coma. We are gifting our resources to maintain that person. That person is an end. And we could talk about persons as means or persons as ends. We treat a person as a means, we can treat them as a slave or some type, type of property. We could, uh, or we could treat a person as an end. And we treat a person as an end when, we, when they're good as our, our, our end, we, we, their, their well-being is our end, and so we help them, whether they're in a coma, they're unconscious, something of that sort, or perhaps a, a, a beggar who is, or someone who's starving, you give them food, and they accept that food. Um, the, the, the other thing to consider as well is when we buy and sell, we're, all, we're not treating each other as means. We're actually helping each other to achieve our separate ends. Sure. Right? It's, 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 it's so, some people who are very concerned about ethics and morals, they see the market and they see people using each other as means. And it's, but it's, there's a, the voluntary relationship there is that you have different ends. You have your family you want to take care of. I have my family. I don't have a family yet, but some, someday I will. I, I have my family I'm going to want to take care of. And you, I have $5 and you have the apple. I buy the, I give you $5. I get the apple. Apple or apples go to support me and my family. And the $5 goes to you and to, to achieve whatever end you need to achieve. So um, the market is the means of which we are able to pursue our ends in a, in a voluntary manner. And also it, uh, it allows, an, allows us to, to maximize the ends of which we're willing to achieve. Well, but I just want to clarify with you a couple of things. First, Mises sees means and ends uh, as a rational decision, not as, as having a moral or ethical component, at least as regards praxeology and economics itself. Uh, and second, you know, how ought we think about altruism then, about uh, gifts, about s s supposedly selfless action? We think of them as, as occurring generally within uh, economic action or generally without, outside of economic action? So uh, regarding altruism, in an, in, 
economic action and outside Mises has a quote in this in human action where he talks about a general, a business owner hires his buddy and pays him more than his productivity level. That margin above the productivity level is a gift. That's what he says it is. It's a right. gift. It's not, um, he's, he, the business owner's taking a loss. He's in, engaging it in consumption, which is the, you know, the technical term we use in economics, which a lot of folks care about ethics freak out about, but it's, it's just a technical term. It's a formal term. You know, it's, 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 um, so he does talk about that. Another thing about means and ends. Yes. So means and ends also assumes rationality that we can are able to understand cause and effect that we can reason about which means will achieve which ends. Um, of course, Mises also do, talks about the ultimate end as well, but he doesn't define that. He defines, um, the ultimate, he calls it happiness, satisfaction, contentment, whatever formal term you want to use, but praxeology, it doesn't talk about what is the ultimate end of human beings, right? Um, he, it's all about the means and ends framework, praxis, action. It's not about how should our ends be, what hierarchy of ends is moral and proper? Mm -hmm. What is the ultimate end? That's ethics, metaphysics, and things like that. Well, I think what gets confusing for people here is sometimes is that Mises' insistence that economics per se is a value-free science. It's concerned with, with looking at catalactics and means ends comparisons, but, uh, uh, but that of course, the, the average person knows that all human action is imbued with uh, moral and ethical questions. We can never <laughs> completely separate them, but, but, but conceptually, it's important to separate them in terms of studying in an academic discipline, in terms of science. Yes. Um, so, the way I, I handle this often is I say, we start with the a priori truth or the axiom, whatever you want to call it, of action. Action implies choice. Choice implies scarcity. Is that value neutral? Is that true? And and, and then scarcity implies the law of returns, that there's an optimal um, output uh, if we hold all variables constant and just, you know, um, change one of the input variables. And... Uh, so I, I, I bring that up with folks and, you know, folks who are usually opposed to Austrian economics will say, OK, I agree with that. OK, so that's the first step to make. So we're, we're, we're it, it, at some point, praxeology needs to be integrated with ethics. Um, right. But we can do logic without necessarily considering the ethical or the, the, the ideological because Austrian economics doesn't have to be integrated. It can be integrated with libertarianism, conservatism, all sorts. Of, you can be a socialist, remember, a socialist and a, and a praxeologist. It just probably would mean that you think the ideal society is that of the tribe or some super primitive economy where, 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 where we have no wealth. Well, so let's apply this, this thinking to something that all human beings are concerned about, which is relationships, whether that be dating or marriage or parenting or even just friendships, uh, what, would, what would Mises say about these kind of relationships? And co contrast that maybe with uh, what Thomas Aquinas would say about personal relationships from a Catholic perspective. C can the two be uh, meet, meet in the middle in any way, or are they just a separate way of looking at the world? So I think it's more about compatibility. Well, what Mises does throughout human action, throughout his writings, he assumes, he takes as given things that human beings seem to all want peace, prosperity, et cetera. And he says, okay, I'm not gonna talk about whether those things actually should or should not be taken as the, a good society. I'm just gonna assume that. What Aquinas does, of course, is he gives us an ultimate end, supreme happiness, face-to-face -face vision with God. But when, when we go further into that, um, the highest virtue for Aquinas is agapic love, that is treat, doing good into the other. Okay. And so if we, wa if, um, we want to, talk about Mises and Aquinas. I think where Mises leaves a f empty formalism, formal term of ultimate end, we can take Aquinas and put him in there. We can also talk about Aquinas and praxeology does give us a way to think about the gifts as well. And so we can have the situation in relationships where, you know, husband and wife, the husband and wife want to achieve the good for each other. And so you, but that actually means you have to choose ends. Like what, what what does well-being mean for the other person? What means do I use to achieve their well-being and vice versa? Uh, in a sense, there's a bit of on entrepreneurial activity where you have to actually speculate and say, what would be good for this person and how will they react to it? Someone who's in a coma, it's pretty simple. You give them nutrition and hope they wake up, right? Uh, someone who's lying in a ditch, it's pretty clear. Pick them up, bring them to the inn. 
Um, someone who's active and, a, and also a conscious actor, you actually have to think about how they interpret the thing you're giving them or the gift, so which can result in asymmetric interpretation. You can have the situation, um, you know, different, different two people from two different cultures meet each other. Maybe the, the guy gives a gift, one person gives a gift, and that gift is understood to be completely heinous, you know. So uh, there, there's that subjectivity component that's very important in praxeology. Uh, we do, we understand the world through the way we've been raised and our, all the, the ideologies and ideas that we, we've, uh, we've learned, and we apply it to understand which ends are appropriate in given situations. Um, and so, sure, we want to give, we want to act lovingly, we want to give the other person their due. Um, however, we actually have to interpret that. We have to understand what is their good and how will they interpret that. Well, I like what you said earlier, which is that any sort of ideological worldview could adopt Austrian economics in terms of just viewing means and ends and understanding the relation between them. But I want to go a little farther here on Aquinas. A, a lot of religious folks don't much like free market economics. In other words, they say that religion, especially Christianity, naturally presupposes a degree of caring about our fellow man, that somehow this ultra-rationalist economics uh, sh shuns to the side, and that, uh, you know, gee whiz, Michael, really hardcore uh, Austrian or free market economics is not all that compatible with Christianity. So, so give us your thoughts on this. Give us a rebuttal. Oh. So my way of handling this isn't going – a lot of economists will go and see economics produces massive prosperity. But it's a dynamic economy which can result in you know instability for families, and that's not good. So what I prefer to do is actually – let's start from the beginning. Let's go to the foundations of uh, praxeology, the foundations of Thomism for the, for, for the Catholics, for the, for the Christians who like Thomism, or even the, 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 the agnostics and atheists who like realism because Thomism is also known as realism. So let's talk about what – what are the elements of human action in Aquinas? What are the elements of, pra of praxeology? And what we see is rationality. Rationality is in both. That is reason, ability to understand cause and effect, to use means to achieve ends. Um, we, we also talk about free will. Free will is also both in praxeology and Aquinas. Uh, we have, for, for Aquinas, Aquinas usually talks about um, free will in terms of, we have all these we live in a world of particulars. You know, this is also high. This is um, praxeology is high. We, we live in a world where we have, when we have to choose particular ends and we have to use particular means. And so we have choice about how we'll, what hierarchy of ends and what means will, we will achieve to use that ends, those ends. Of course, there's um, not so much free will regarding the ultimate end, that we're always trying to alleviate uneasiness. Well, as particular finite beings, we're always in a state of uneasiness. We're always, act, non-action is not really a choice. Um, Teleological, right? Uh, human action in praxeology is teleological. So there's a telos, there's an ultimate end, and we are all driven toward that ultimate end. Uh, what else? Uh, well, it's non-satiation. Non non we can never be satiated in all our des desires. We cannot achieve all the ends we wish to achieve. We're in constant pursuit of ends, and we are in constant pursuit of that ultimate end, happiness, both in Aquinas and both in Mises. Um, transitivity, uh, okay, so um, transitivity is the idea I prefer A to B. I prefer B to C. Therefore, I prefer A to C. Mises dismisses that idea of transitivity, which most neoclassical mainstream microeconomists use, as the, the fact that action takes place through time. We have many. We don't make all our actions at once. We 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 go through time. Aquinas deals attacks transitivity by saying we live in a world of uncertainty. That's Rothbard. That's Mises. Same thing. You know, we we are uncertain about the future. Um, and the other thing to consider is that Rothbard, he considers himself a realist or a Thomist. You can see his uh, article, extreme, uh, the article on extreme a priorism. Uh, another great economist, uh, not economist, he's, he's a philosopher. He's the president of the Action Institute, Gabriel Zanotti, uh, Action Institute in Argentina. He has all these articles in Spanish. I have to relearn Spanish to read those articles, but there's some in English that you can access where he discusses how Thomism and praxeology can be combined. And I'm really building off that work. In that paper, I'm, it's 50 pages right now. Um, it's probably going to be three or four articles. I have to somehow split it up. But uh, I'm going at the foundations. Are the foundations compatible? And where I see is not that not are they only compatible, they're complementary or they're even identical. And so then we can ask, don't the really the only place where they're not identical is that ultimate end. What is happiness? What is the good of which we're in pursuit? Which, but but Mises is something very simple. He says, 
I'm not, that's not, praxeology doesn't tell us what the ultimate end is. Aquinas does. And so we just take it and fill it, fill it in that formal placeholder. Right. So to, to understand this very sort of thin definition of happiness that Mises proposes, um, you talk about his quote from Human Action, we call a man happy who has succeeded in attaining his end. So that's pretty mm-hmm. thin. In other words, uh, a crack addict may say, I yes. really want to get high and go uh, obtain some crack and get high, but they have, probably haven't done themselves any favors in the long run. So that's, that's sort of outside the uh, Misesian paradigm. But So I want to I expand upon this, this idea that, uh, of rationality, that there's some connection between means and ends that actually works. Uh, even Austrians aren't, uh, don't fully accept this, the idea, you know, call it Mill's idea of homo economicus. In other words, there, there's bounded rationality. We, we have limited mm-hmm. knowledge at our fingertips, even with computers. And so we're, not only is morality perhaps outside of Mises' analysis, but also uh, perfect knowledge. We don't, we, we don't always have all the information to make perfectly rational means and calculations. And uh, we don't have perfect knowledge. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. We don't know what people's, my, we don't even know what our future preferences are going to be. I don't know what your future preferences are going to be. I don't know what the heck's going to happen in the world in the future because we don't, we, we don't have that. Um, there's all sorts of asymmet- asymmetries in the world, which of course entrepreneurship is supposed to deal with, right? Um, every, asymm- a, every asymmetry is a profit opportunity in some way. If you can get the property rights right. Um, so Rothbard, ah, yes, Rothbard defines in Man, Economy, and State, uh, psychology, ethics, praxeology, history, right? And one of the definitions he gives for ethics is, um, how we arrange our ends, uh, what, how should we should arrange our ends, right? What ends should we achieve and how we should arrange them? Of course, also the relationship between me, which means would also be proper to those ends. I would add that as well. Um, and so as long as the foundations of human action between two ethical theories are the same, which I think what you have in Aquinas and Mises, you can get to integrating them and synthesizing them. And so it won't just be, uh, some, you don't just have to be utilitarian to be an Austrian economist. You don't have to buy into say Rothbard's natural law to be an Austrian economist. You can be uh, a conservative. You can be, uh, from all these different backgrounds, you can use Austrian economics. I mean, what's one of the one of the best examples of Austrian economics applied? It's ordo liberalism. Wilhelm Röpke. We, you know, I read Wilhelm Röpke, and I'm thinking, you know, I don't agree all the time with what he actually, you know, everything in in a humane economy. But in general, I I prefer that than what we have now. And so, if Austrian economics can be more influential, I see that as a step in the right direction. As as for Homo economicus, that's very true. Austrian economics does not need the homo economicus. We don't need the assumption that human beings are trying to maximize pleasure or maximize profit. That's that's totally not required um, because profit and loss determine what survives and what doesn't. It's uh, the profit just rewards productivity, losses reward on productivity. It's more of an evolutionary situation. The, 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 the term that, so where, where, Christ, where Christians or folks who are very concerned about morals and ethics go wrong is when they assume that we assume all behavior has to be selfish and profit maximizing when that's not, that's not a requirement. And, you know, Mises does, and Rothbard talks about that, but it seems that those quotes go often unrecognized. The other thing to remember is that Austrian economists of themselves have come from different foundational backgrounds. So you have Menger, Morris, Aristotelian with Brentano, Mises, Kantian, utilitarian, Rothbard, sure. realist, and natural law. And so there's that variety which a lot of folks who look at Austrian economics don't even recognize. They think we're all utilitarians and we're all um, the homo economicus. Well, I want to talk about the realm of human action that's not necessarily voluntary or is even forced. And I'm thinking, let's say, warfare when the marketplace breaks down. And I'm thinking in terms of slavery. Yeah. Uh, you know, give us how, how can praxeology uh, uh, approach involuntary uh, human action, and, and what what would Aquinas have to say about it? So let's let's do slavery. Uh, slavery, you have a property in someone else. Property are what means use property to achieve ends. So human beings are end are trying to achieve ends. So when you treat a human being as a slave, and human beings have free will, and we can act and we choose ends. 
we're um, we're not treating the human person as what they are. We're forcing them to do things that we 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 want them to do. So on slavery, you know, that, that there's that, that issue that we're treating someone as property when they themselves have, in a sense, they're their own property in some in some way. When we treat a person as a means, we misunderstand the nature of that person. Every person is an ends and of themselves. And so we have to have, then that's what, so property should serve people. People should not be property required to serve others. In terms of war, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I can go there. So you'd be talking more about the, the issues with the draft or? Uh, well, or, the idea is that war isn't humans in, interacting voluntarily. It's it's more akin to the fist, the, the fisticuffs you alluded to yeah. earlier in our conversation. It's it's uh, aggression. Yeah. So also there's no market. There's not much market exchange in the military. There's a command and an order and there's an end you want to achieve. The end is not. Um, it, it, and also that the profit loss mechanism doesn't, doesn't necessarily apply in the same way. Uh, a military wants to defeat its enemy, per se, or defeat a country or get, grab some land. That's its end. And it's going to use the resources of the economy as its means to do that and people as means to do that. Um, so it's a completely different way. It, it's, it's not the market. It's uh, it's much more closer to autistic action. I haven't thought this question out through it uh, really enough, but it's yeah, it's it's uh, more command control. Um, it's not spontaneous order. It's more, much more essentially planned uh, a situation. And perhaps, you know, I, I'll admit there are probably some situations where we um, may want to engage in that. Say if you're being invaded by the Nazis, you probably want to engage in in, in, in a war. Well. The fact that this is all so complex and that all uh, that logic and philosophy and economics are so interrelated, I think, shows that Mises was on the right path in in writing a book as broad and sweeping as human action. But I think it also shows that there's not too many economists who are necessarily equipped uh, to do that themselves. So that said, Michael, thank you again for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.